Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and honored guests. We are so pleased that you could be with us tonight. We've anticipated this evening for many months, and we are delighted for your attendance. The evening uh, events are co-sponsored by the Institute for Renaissance and Reformation Biblical Studies of Stone Mountain, Georgia, and the Institute for Biblical Textual Studies of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Both organizations are 501c3 nonprofit entities. Both are concerned with the education of the Christian public with regards to the validity of the traditional texts of, of the Bible, biblical criticism, and ancient texts. Our lecture this evening is Dr. Theodore P. Letus. I have known Ted for over 20 years. He is a rigorous and dedicated scholar. Ted has been a steady champion of the faith in all the years I've known him. We first met through Dr. David Otis Fuller when Ted was a budding master's student at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. We became better acquainted through conferences and collaborating on publishing projects as he completed his master's work at Emory. Later, he was my personal tour guide when I visited, visited him during his doctoral studies at Edinburgh. And by the way, no one has had a better personal guide through church history in England. Dr. Theodore P. Letus is the director of the Institute for Renaissance and Reformation Biblical Studies. He is the past president of the University of Edinburgh Theological Society and is currently a member of the Society of Biblical Literature, where he has served on the steering committee for the History of Interpretation section. He also has been a member of the American Academy of Religion, where he is currently part of the Seminar Historical Consciousness and its impact on the Christian churches. He's also a member of the American Society of Church History. He has a PhD from the University of Edinburgh in Ecclesiastical History and honors MTS from Emory University in American Church History. He has completed graduate studies at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia, Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, Indiana. He also holds the BA degree in Biblical Studies and History from Evangel College with additional undergraduate studies completed at Southwest Missouri State University. He has authored and edited several books including the Majority Text, Essays and Reviews in the Continuing Debate and the Ecclesiastical Text uh, text Criticism, Biblical Authority, in the Popular Mind, 2nd edition, 2000. Ted has also had a very active lecturing schedule for, throughout his career. I will name but uh, a few of his lectures on a very long list. He has lectured before the Evangelical the Theological Society, presenting his paper, B.B. Warfield's Common Sense Philosophy and New Testament Criticism. He has also lectured before the Scottish University's Ecclesiastical History Conference, the Theological University in Campen, and to the English and Medieval Studies Department at Trinity College Dublin, and finally to the annual international meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature in Berlin, Ger Germany last year. It is my pleasure to present Dr. Theodore P. Leedis. Thanks, Russ. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out this evening, all of you. And uh, these are bleak days we're living in when there's uh, a downward slide in a any number of areas, particularly in the academic and publishing world, even in the world of journalism. Uh, we read about people committing plagiarism. Uh, it just seems the standards are uh, uh, in, in, in rapid decline at the moment. So for people to be interested in archaeology and manuscript evidence and the transmission of the Bible is very heartening. And I'm pleased that you took your weekend time out to come and be with us this evening uh, to help us to, uh, to talk about um, manuscript evidences and the transmission of the text of the Bible. Um, the, the name of our institute is the Institute for Renaissance and Reformation Biblical Studies. And it's because we feel like um, while the Renaissance and the Reformation eras were not necessarily absolutely golden eras, they were extraordinarily important in the flow and the history of Western civilization. It's when the Bible itself became a driving force to cause the rank and the file to become literate. People wanted to learn how to read so they could read the Bible.
And the Protestant notion of the priesthood of all believers uh, is also a very important principle that uh, our institute uh, would like to see um, encouraged and, and promoted as much as possible. And so, to that end, we have a book table out there that we hope that you will take the pains to survey before you leave this evening. Because many of the titles on that table will help to further elucidate uh, what might well be a very provocative lecture for you tonight. So please do go by there and look at the sources and the materials. Now we just got done uh, touring uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, or fragments of them, and so our sensibilities have all been electrified and we're thinking about texts and we're thinking about uh, uh, communities out in the desert storing manuscripts and, and uh, what's entailed in the writing and the copying and scriptoria, uh, preserving and transmitting manuscripts. Howbeit, we're not going to say much about the Old Testament. Uh, consider your visit to Qumran tonight and the Dead Sea Scrolls, your dose of Old Testament studies. Now we're going to uh, pass from the intertestamental period into the New Testament. Because uh, our, our theme, the quest for the historical text, has to do with a parallel movement within New Testament studies called the quest for the historical Jesus. And um, the relationship between the higher critical pinnacle of historical criticism, which we know as the quest for the historical Jesus, and its relationship to uh, another discipline known as lower criticism, or textual criticism. Uh, is there any relationship between lower textual criticism uh, and higher criticism. Uh, I will tell you right now that in virtually every evangelical seminary in the United States, and there aren't many of those in Europe, so we don't even have to bring them into the discussion, the few that there are, but here in the United States, every seminary that considers itself either conservative, confessional, or evangelical will tell their students in first year Greek that textual criticism never involves speculation, it never involves any serious degree of subjectivity, and it will most certainly, absolutely never affect doctrine. It is only those practitioners of historical criticism or higher criticism as it takes place on the campuses of Princeton, Brown, Harvard, Yale, uh, Claremont School of Theology, uh, University of Pennsylvania, at Emory University. This is where you find unbelieving higher criticism. And that the two must never, never, never be confused with one another. Because one is objective, it affirms the faith, textual criticism. The other is subjective and is a destructive force attempting to undermine the faith. I'm here to tell you that is, that is possibly one of the grossest confused statements or positions that has ever been articulated in the history of Christian theology. And I'll say further that it just absolutely isn't true. And I'll begin by telling you that in the 19th century, these two disciplines were always understood as two halves of a whole. That's why one was called lower criticism, the textual criticism, and one was called higher criticism, the quest for the historical Jesus. Why were they called lower and higher if they weren't defined against and in relationship to one another? Because they were, in fact, two stages of a single development. Lower criticism is what you did initially to sort out all the textual evidence. Higher criticism is what you formulated or postulated up and beyond the textual foundation of the lower criticism. They were always two stages of the same enterprise. And any evangelical scholar that tells their students they are not related is, is, is fabricating. Because they are, they have been, and they always will be one single enterprise. So in my PhD dissertation, one of the major themes was as follows. The quest for the historical text, as reflected here on the title pages of the most current edition of the critical Greek New Testament, the quest for the historical text always culminates 
in the quest for the historical Jesus. And what I hope to document this evening to you in this lecture are, are some of the liniments, some of the details that elucidate this theme. And if you go away realizing nothing else, you must leave this auditorium tonight having a fuller appreciation of the fact that there is nothing innocent or innocuous about trying to find the historical text because there is a presupposition in the enterprise of questing for the historical text that is identical with an assumption or presupposition that's in the higher criticism and namely it is this that the church has fabricated the data and the evidence about who Jesus was, what he said, and what he did. And that in, in order to find out the truth and the reality of the Christ experience and event of the first century AD, we have to go behind what is called the ecclesiastical text and rummage through the fragmentary sources that exist behind it from the second and third century and speculate on into the first century in order to find out what really happened because the church told us a colossal lie in fabricating and editing an artificial manufactured edition of the Greek New Testament that was expansive, that evolved, that turned an itinerant Jewish preacher prophet into the Son of God and the second person of the Trinity. That is the assumption of higher criticism and the innocent appearing quest for the historical text always takes you to that conclusion. Whether you are a consistent enough practitioner to go there or not, that is where the road leads. You may decide to get off and be inconsistent, but that the road goes there cannot be denied. And if you'll notice the name of the last editor of the Nessel Island Greek New Testament, it's Bruce M. Metzger. And what I just declared to you about the text that the church has always received as being a true account of who Jesus was, what I call the ecclesiastical text, what Burgon called the traditional text, that it is believed in text critical circles that that is a vast and massive corruption and, and illegitimate editing of the accounts. Metzger himself admits in the very title of his handbook that every seminary student in the United States reads when they begin to tackle the subject of text criticism. And I will rehearse that title to you just now. In 1964, as a young PhD student, graduate from Princeton Theological Seminary, Bruce Metzger published through Oxford University Press a handbook that has been in print continuously since 1964, whose title is The Text of the New Testament, semicolon, colon, subtitled, its transmission, its corruption, and its restoration. Now, in the very title of his book, he is telling his students that there was a stage in the transmission of the Greek New Testament where there was a vast amount of corruption that took place. And it wasn't all accidental. Much of it was quite deliberate. It was deliberate editorial activity that took part, part on the place of the Orthodox who expanded Christological themes in the New Testament that made Christ divine when there may have otherwise been serious question as to whether he was anything but an itinerant prophet had this editorial expansive activity not taken place. Now to further reinforce that theme I will recount to you the title of another book by one of Bruce Metzger's students who earned a PhD under Bruce. His name is Bart Ehrman. He also published a very important book through the press of Oxford University and its title is even more provocative. It is titled The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture Christological Controversies in the Early Church. And this is the most systematic statement and analysis of all the data of all the New Testament manuscripts, versions and fathers that has ever been written, attempting to elucidate in great detail the claim that Bruce Metzger made in his book, namely, at one stage in the transmission of the New Testament, it was not heretics who altered the text of Scripture, but rather the Orthodox Church that systematically and comprehensively 
altered the manuscript witnesses to whom Jesus was and to what he said. And it is at that, that point that the invitation to the higher critical project then uh, is uh, initiated. Now in the early church, in the early Reformation church I should say, it was Desterius Erasmus who first got the scent that there was serious corruption in the Bible. However, it was not the Greek Bible, which is what Bruce Metzger and his student refers to. Erasmus discovered Lorenzo Valla's Annotationes on the Latin Vulgate Bible accidentally in a library as a handwritten manuscript where Lorenzo Valla had listed all the divergencies in the Latin Bible from the Greek manuscripts that were flooding into Europe at, by that time because of the fall of Constantinople in 1453. When Erasmus read Valla's findings and realized that the Latin Bible was so dissimilar to the Greek Bible, he made a decision then and there that he was going to give the Western Church the benefit of the oldest form of the Bible, not a translation in Latin, but rather ad fontes, the original Greek text. He was going to uh, edit it and restore it and, and let that be the foundation of a renewal movement that he hoped uh, would take place as a result of this momentous event. And he did just that. But in comparing all of his Greek witnesses, after having taught himself the Greek language, after comparing all the manuscripts, he discovered that he could not find any Greek witnesses for the so-called three heavenly witnesses in, in the first epistle of John, chapter 7. Um, uh, chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. And so in his first edition, he made an assumption that the Latin church, who everyone by that time knew had forged documents all over the place, the most celebrated one was the donation of Constantine, of course. Erasmus sensed that since he couldn't find the three heavenly witnesses in any Greek manuscripts, this too must have been a corruption on the part of the Latin church uh, to fend off the challenge of the Arians in the early fourth century. So he left it out. He received a tremendous amount of criticism. There were threats from Spain to have his Greek New Testament and himself burnt at the stake. So uh, it was actually an opportune development that a Roman Catholic English scholar by the name of Edward Lee brought to Erasmus's attention that there was a Greek codex that had the three heavenly witnesses in it. And uh, this was a, a very opportune development from Erasmus's standpoint because it meant he could put the verse back in and uh, forego his being burned at the stake. So in his third edition, he put the three heavenly witnesses back in. But in his annotations, he continued to suggest serious doubt about whether they were authentic. And I will tell you further that in my PhD research, I discovered that Erasmus had very grave and serious misgivings about the notion of the Trinity. He believed that as a theological development, as a concept, that it was, a, uh, it was an afterthought, it was a construct that came out of the theological weavings of the church under the influence of Hellenism, and that it was not a teaching of the earliest expression of Christianity. He went on to, 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 to make clear in many of his writings that he did not like the Nicene Creed because he, he felt it expressed this late developmental understanding of who Jesus was. Erasmus liked the Apostles' Creed and uh, he believed that that was the uh, definitive confessional statement that the church should begin a new renewal movement in order to get back to her moorings, to get back to her roots, and to exclude the corruptions of late medieval uh, scholasticism. Now he obviously had to be very coy, had to be very clever and be very quiet about these ideas because they certainly would get him, uh, get the attention of the Inquisition. And in fact he was called up before the Inquisition and had to defend his orthodoxy wherein he said, no matter what I have ever said, let it be known that if you determine, if the magisterium of the church determines that I'm in error on these points, I will submit to the teaching of the church on those points. And that's, of course, how he could assert one thing on one hand and assert something else on the other. But all of the data that he compiled against the Trinity in his, in his works um, uh, caught the interest of another renegade scholar by the name of Servetus. Servetus actually uh, 
uh, attempted to make contact with Erasmus and share notes with him because he was going in the same direction as Erasmus, only er uh, Servetus lacked the wisdom and the good judgment to be, uh, shall we say, uh, discreet about his ideas. He was a radical and he wanted to have an impact on the church with his ideas and actually published and promoted the idea that the, uh, the, the doctrine of the Trinity was a profound error. Erasmus deferred making any contact with Servetus. He said, thank you, but no thanks, and the, the, the meeting never took place. But there was an attempt for, uh, to, for there to be a conference between the two of them. Now, after Erasmus's demise, his annotations were the first critical approach to the development of the discipline of text criticism that anybody would ever read in the history of the modern, early modern church. That is, his was the beginning of critical biblical criticism. Not his text. His text very uncreatively merely uh, reproduced the consensus of the Greek Orthodox Church and made no attempt to reconstruct something better or more clever. He accepted the standard of the Greek Orthodox Church. But in his annotations, he had some very radical ideas. In fact, people don't realize that he was aware of many of the major variants that Codex Vaticanus had because he had a close friend in the Vatican Library. But any scholar who began to investigate the idea of the Trinity or wanted to delve into the notion of the variations in the Greek New Testament would go to Erasmus's annotations first. And there they would find all of Erasmus's misgivings about the Trinity. We move up now to the 17th century and the gentleman we see on the screen at the moment. This is the famous Sir Isaac Newton, uh, the founder of the modern discipline of physics, a devout believer all of his life, and a man who gave up all interest in physics for the last 40 years of his life and devoted himself to writing theological treatises, particularly dealing with things like eschatology. But one of the subjects that he addressed that very few people know about um, uh, is the, 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 the discipline of text criticism. He read Erasmus's annotations and read Erasmus's misgivings about the Trinity and uh, began to rummage through all the evidence and suddenly realized that the New Testament was not as clear on the Trinity as it might be once it was shed of the three heavenly witnesses. So he wanted to do what Erasmus was afraid of doing and composed an entire treatise titled Two Notable Corruptions of the Scripture. And uh, I actually have brought along with me a photograph of the manuscript first page of this publication at the hands in the very handwriting of Sir Isaac Newton himself. This is the, uh, the manuscript that's in the Bodleian Library and at the top of it it reads, an historical account of two notable corruptions of scripture and a letter to a friend. And the two notable corruptions were the three heavenly witnesses, these three are one, the Father, the, uh, the Word, and the Spirit, the other notable corruption was 1 Timothy 3.16, which he believed um, had been corrupted and made to read God was manifest in the flesh instead of the original reading as he believed it to be, who was manifest in the flesh. And he wrote an entire treatise. And he sent it to a French uh, radical critic by the name of Le Clerc in Amsterdam to be published in a new radical journal, but it would be published in French uh, anonymously because... Uh, the irony of Sir uh, Isaac Newton, who was then denying, openly denying the Trinity, holding down a teaching post at Trinity College, Cambridge, would be much more than most people could bear. And so he wanted to make sure that if it was published, it was published in French, and his name would not be attached to it. He almost have a ner had a nervous breakdown worrying about this, because to be anti-Trinitarian in 17th century England meant you could not indeed hold a post at any university. Uh, and in fact, uh, you would be pushed to the margins of society. But to give you an idea of uh, some of uh, uh, Isaac Newton's rationale about this, I'm going to read to you from uh, an essay I've written on this subject a little bit here. Newton has traditionally been invoked by the faithful as perhaps the greatest luminary ever to grace the Christian religion with his allegiance. 
It was a surprise to learn, therefore, some years after his death, that, quote, privately, he denied the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ as both unintelligible and unscriptural, unquote. This was revealed when an unpublished manuscript by Newton was discovered. It was a treatise devoted specifically to proving the spuriousness of the Coma Johannium, the three heavenly witnesses, and the orthodox variant at 1 Timothy 3.16. Uh, this was highlighted in his work, An Historical Account of Two Notable Corruptions of the Scripture in a Letter to a Friend, published around, or, or written, I should say, around 1687 1690. We're not absolutely certain what day it was. <clears throat> However, it was not discovered and published until 1754, almost 30 years after Newton's death. Died in 1727. One biographer calls this Newton's, quote, most important theological tract, unquote. While he was alive, there were always rumors about Newton's unorthodoxy, even in his day, to be found denying the Trinity, while not, a dangerous, not as dangerous as in Erasmus' day, could still mean one would be deprived of a teaching post at the university. At worst, one might face imprisonment. This explains why it was Newton's original purpose to have the work published anonymously in the French language. Then, if all went well, he would also have it published in English. Newton's thorough refutation of the authenticity of these two proof texts, quote, the two on which the doctrine of the Trinity is principally based, unquote, coming from the very father of the new science, was nothing short of devastating to the cause of orthodoxy. And I quote from another author commenting on the quality of Newton's research on this point, quote, his knowledge of Greek and the Latin fathers the theologians of the Middle Ages, and the history of sacred learning as displayed in this work, impresses the reader with amazement at the universality of his powers and attainments." Unquote. This work represents the capstone to the now 200-year-long attempt on the part of anti-Trinitarians to shake loose from the influence of Orthodox tradition by revealing what the, appears to them to be the faulty textual evidence at its base. They now had the most important advocate, perhaps since Erasmus, arguing their side. Erasmus had disrupted confidence in the Vulgata Latina by discovering its textual corruptions, thus precipitating the Protestant tradition. Analogously, the Protestant theological tradition was now shown to the anti-Trinitarians, would argue, to be based also on a faulty text as well. If one could no longer have confidence in the sacred text of the church, one must now look for certainty elsewhere. Newton held out the promise of science. Deism was one ultimate result. If the God of revealed religion could no longer be trusted, as the deists would eventually argue, based on Newton's research, surely the God of natural religion could. Now, this isn't the end of the story, because Newton inspired all kinds of uh, enlightenment sense uh, impulses and um, inclinations, one of which was uh, expressed in an argument that Anthony Collins put to the Orthodox in his day, that there were over 30,000 textual variants in the Greek New Testament, and therefore, could, how could anybody in his right mind believe that the text had been verbally inspired? And so this was a serious crisis for the doctrine of verbal inspiration. And I will quote again from this essay. Collins, a deist, who had been influenced by Isaac Newton, demanded to know based on the collection of variants by the text critic John Mill, who was orthodox, by the way, how 30,000 variants could exist in a document divinely inspired by verbal dictation. Well, this obviously caused a, 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 a furor of, of doubt and confusion amongst evangelicals and conservatives in the Church of England. And so a champion came forward to answer Anthony Collins. <clears throat> 
And this is a very important episode in the history of textual criticism. Because Richard Bentley, who was Orthodox, his reply to Anthony Collins has been echoed over and over and over again by the Orthodox right down to the present day. And namely that uh, no matter how many textual variants there are, none of them ever affects doctrine. And that was the essence of uh, Bentley's response. Uh, here's his challenge and counter charge to Collins. He says, quote, Make your 30,000 textual variants, as many or more, if numbers of copies can be reached to that sum. All the better to a knowing and serious reader who is thereby more richly furnished, furnished to select what he sees genuine. But even put them into the hands of a knave or a fool, and yet with the most sinisterous and absurd choice, he shall not extinguish the light of any one chapter, nor so disguise Christianity, but that every feature of it will still be the same." Unquote. Now, when I mentioned to you earlier in my opening remarks that every evangelical seminary in the United States teaches their students that textual criticism never affects doctrine, this is where they got that notion. They got it from Richard Bentley in reply to Anthony Collins. However, Richard Bentley himself knew that this was a disingenuous response. Because he knew that Isaac Newton was an anti-Trinitarian. And he knew that if, if Newton himself had been affected by textual variation, to an extent that he actually gave up the Trinity, as smart as he was, then perhaps textual criticism and textual variance had more virulent challenge to the faith of inspiration than Bentley was willing to admit. Well, you see that what Erasmus started now is beginning to snowball. I show you here the, the instruments of another scientist another hundred years later down the line from the 18th century. These are the actual instruments of Joseph Priestley, uh, who's uh, attributed with having discovered the gas of oxygen, uh, one of the most learned men of all of the 18th century, but, however, who also was an anti-Trinitarian. Bentley, uh, rather Priestley, also began his study, his critical study of the Greek New Testament by reading the annotations of Erasmus. And once again was put on the scent of the fact that there was some serious doubt about the three heavenly witnesses. And by the time he got done his text critical work, he had gone much further than Newton. Newton had denied 1 Timothy 3.16. He had denied the three heavenly witnesses. But Priestley had given up the virgin birth. And his rationale for giving up the virgin birth in the Gospel of Matthew, in the first chapter of Matthew, was based on the evidence found in the debate surrounding the three heavenly witnesses. And I will give you his own account, his own autobiographical account, of how he came to disbelieve that Christ was virginly conceived based on textual variation. Joseph Priestley, quote, There is one particular subject on which I have much enlarged in this treatise, and about which I had no intention to write at all when I began to collect materials for it. It is the miraculous conception of Jesus, concerning which I had not at that time entertained any doubt. Though I well knew that several very eminent and learned Christians of ancient and modern times had disbelieved it. The case was that in practicing in perusing the early Christian writers with a view to collect all opinions concerning Christ, I found so much on this subject that I could not help giving particular attention to it. And it being impossible not to be struck with the absurdity of their reasoning about it, those who were defending the virgin birth, I was by degrees led to think whether anything better could be said in proof of the fact and at length, my collections and speculations grew to the size that is now before the reader. And he goes on to give his reasons why he believed the virgin birth was an afterthought 
added to the Gospel of Matthew. His argument is that the original Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew, of which there is patristic evidence. There was an early Hebrew edition of Matthew. And that in the Hebrew edition of Matthew, that some early church fathers acknowledged that the opening chapter of our Greek Matthew was not present, and therefore there was no affirmation of the virgin birth. And on that basis, he, though he believed in the virgin birth, up to that point, gave it up. But the, the clincher for him was the evidence that Erasmus had provided and Isaac Newton had provided on the three heavenly witnesses. And I will quote one more short paragraph from, priest, uh, from Priestley acknowledging this. And I quote, The famous verse 1 John 5, 7, concerning the three that bear record in heaven, has been sufficiently proved to have come into the epistle in this unauthorized manner. And had it been done in an early period, there would have appeared no more reason to have suspected the genuineness of it than there now does that of the introduction to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. So he's using that as a paradigm. If we look at how the three heavenly witnesses were introduced into the text, we can then understand how the virgin birth may have been introduced into the text late. And you can begin to see how this quick scan, panoramic scan down through the history of text criticism, bears out what Metzger believes happened. All of these scholars are saying there was a point at which these teachings were illegitimately brought into the text by scribes with undue imaginative editorial activity. And so when Metzger talks about the text of the New Testament, its transmission, its corruption, and its restoration, that corruption is what Priestley is talking about. The adding the doctrine of the Trinity, and now the virgin birth and the deity of Christ. This is the nature of the corruption that Metzger is talking about, that Newton thought that he had discovered, and that Priestley thought that he had discovered. And it all began with the innocent questioning of the legitimacy of the three heavenly witnesses on the part of Erasmus. Now, all of this finally came to fruition. All of this is being done, shall we say, behind the scenes, because the average layman and even the average clergyman doesn't know hardly anything about these controversies and these debates. You know, if they don't read Erasmus's annotations, if they don't read Isaac Newton's treatise, which didn't come out until many, many years after he was dead, and uh, by the time Priestley comes along, Unitarianism is a massive movement in Britain in the 18th century. And so the Orthodox don't read Priestley because he's a heretic. And so they don't know any of this evidence. They don't know how powerful an influence textual criticism has had on the best minds in the intellectual community in Great Britain. They just keep reading the authorized version. And they just keep reading the, the Textus Receptus. And as a result, they stay intact and orthodoxy has been preserved until this momentous publishing event of 1881. In 1881, when Westcott and Hort uh, brought their Greek New Testament into the revision committee for the revised version, one of the decisions that the committee made is that a Unitarian would be part of the revision committee. Because for nearly 200 years since Isaac Newton's time, Unitarians had demanded that the Bible be revised so it would reflect the earliest evidence which would thereby vindicate the truth of Unitarianism, as far as they were concerned. That not only had the Roman Catholic Church corrupted doctrine by adding the Virg uh, 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 Mary's assumption uh, that, that, that Mary was perfect and sinless, that uh, we should pray to the saints, that, that there was a purgatory, that the Pope was in fact the infallible head of the church. Not only were these corruptions, but there were actual corruptions that had been brought into the text itself, the Unitarians argued, and one of them was the Trinity, and Priestley eventually argued also the virgin birth. This would be the publishing event that would finally allow all of this evidence to trickle down to the entire Orthodox Church, first in Britain and then in America. Because this is the first time in history that an Orthodox Church, the Church of England, accepted the judgments of Sir Isaac Newton and, and Joseph Priestley and produced an English Bible that was minus the Trinity in 1 John, minus the reference to God in 1 Timothy 3.16, and they kept the virgin birth in because there really wasn't any manuscript evidence for that.
and uh, uh, it, it survived this particular publication. But now the debate was really heating up. And in, in the United States, the scholar who was responsible for making sure that this kind of evidence began to trickle down in the Orthodox communities in the United States was Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, who took Westcott and Hort's theory hook, line, and sinker, almost childlike, without offering any criticism of them to speak of whatsoever. In fact, he published a handbook on textual criticism that was very nearly plagiarism. So completely had he replicated the theories of Westcott and Hort. But in his introductory material, he fulsomely made clear to everyone that there was very little originality here, that what I'm giving you are the arguments that I got secondhand from Westcott and Hort in Great Britain. And so he became so adamant that this text that was more pure because it was less, it had been stripped of all these orthodox accretions, he became almost evangelistic and passionate about forcing people to accept this new textual standard. He wrote a popular treatise in a popular uh, newspaper called the Sunday School Times where he told his readership, you must never attribute to the resurrection account into the, in the Gospel of Mark the idea of th this being an inspired bit of scripture. He told them they must, there was no option, they must reject the last 12 verses of Mark that contain the resurrection and ascension of Christ as spurious and inauthentic. And it was no part of the word of God was his language. So, I mean, even Westcott and Hort hadn't argued with that kind of ferocity that we have to shed these orthodox readings in order to have the historical text, the un corrupted text. And it was not only in text criticism that he naively embraced these very radical historical critical notions, but uh, recent uh, scholars have come to the fore demonstrating that he was one of the earliest advocates of evolution as well. He, he accepted the uh, emerging theoretical speculative aspects of 19th century Victorian science as though uh, he was experiencing some kind of religious epiphany and was quite willing to dispense with with the resurrection in the Gospel of Mark. He was quite willing to dispense with the age-old understanding of Genesis, the 24-hour creation days, as this article makes very clear, an essay that was recently published in the journal of the Presbyterian Historical Society. And there you can see the name Mark Knoll, a very prominent evangelical historian, telling us that, in fact, uh, while Warfield was chanting this new theological word inerrancy, it had absolutely nothing to do with him having a high view of Scripture. If anything, it was something that uh, uh, allowed everyone to put their guard down while, while he convinced them that Darwin was probably right, while he convinced them that there is no resurrection account in the Gospel of Mark. Um, I was very surprised to discover in this article, however, that there was no reference made to my own article that appeared in that same journal pointing out the defects in Warfield's view of textual criticism. They chose to completely ignore my evidence. It would have helped uh, carry their, uh, their argument, I think, if they had alluded, uh, alluded to it. But uh, um, I, I think my evidence was, was a bit more of a confrontative challenge to the evangelical c community. And I didn't handle Warfield with kill, kid gloves the way that Mark Knoll did. So I think uh, that's one reason why they ignored my article. But uh, uh, I, I know it sounds very ironic that Warfield was responsible for this, but he was. The evidence is in my published works on the table. Now, finally, uh, the revised version never took off in Britain and never even took off here. The ASV, uh, because it questioned the resurrection in the Gospel of Mark, it took away the reference to the deity of Christ in 1 Timothy and took out the most explicit reference to the Trinity. Nobody read the American Standard Version very much, except the most liberal wings of the American church. It was not until the Revised Standard Version came along that Warfield's theories about the text finally uh, began to be accepted by the mainstream. But of course, uh, this, this was the most radical English Bible that had been published up to date because the revisers chose to dispense with a virgin birth, not in the Gospel of Matthew, sorry, this is a little fuzzy, but rather in Isaiah. They went right to the source of, the, of Matthew's misconception about the virgin birth, and they changed a very explicit reading 
uh, in Isaiah 7:14, from therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Instead of a young virgin con conceiving, here we see it was just a young woman. Fits tongue and groove with what Priestley felt was the case. Fits tongue and groove with his theory that um, Matthew's assertion of the virgin birth was a late development illegitimately interpolated into the text. And here also uh, you can see, uh, it, while most churchmen, by the way, didn't accept Warfield's decision about the necessity of jettisoning the resurrection in the Gospel of Mark, um, the revision committee of the Revised Version uh, did, Revised Standard Version did. And here you can see the, the last sentence in the Gospel of Mark as it appeared in the original edition of the Revised Standard Version was, uh, for they were afraid... And there's no reference to uh, an eyewitness appearance of Jesus' resurrection. It's been relegated to extraordinarily small type uh, at the bottom of the page. And here they're telling the reader that this is an illegitimate account. Now, uh, the, the, the revised version, the revised standard version, was supposed to take one further radical step. It was supposed to become inclusive uh, in the 80s, the late 80s. And uh, uh, there were those who were very concerned that the Revised Standard Version reflect a kind of egalitarianism and do away with patriarchy. And, uh, but Bruce Metzger, to his credit, came forward and said, uh, you will not uh, make the Bible less patriarchal than the original languages will allow. And this was supposed to be the new Revised Standard Version. The people who were clamoring for it were not given permission for their arguments or their uh, theories to have any place in the new Revised Standard Version. And so they published it separately as a lectionary. And here you can see that they took one of the most radical steps in the history of the English Bible by turning uh, Yahweh into uh, basically an, an ancient fertility god who had a consort, you see. Because when Jesus in the garden goes away and falls down to pray, he prays to uh, my, God my father and mother. Which, of course, they were, had enough integrity to put in brackets because there's no corresponding word in Greek there for matar. It's, it, it's, it's quite arbitrary. But it's put in there so that um, uh, feminists will, will, will not think of God in purely masculine uh, pronouns and will, will think of God as both somehow father and mother. Uh, you can see why Bruce Metzger would not tolerate that because there simply isn't a Greek word for mother in the Greek New Testament, in any manuscript that's ever been found. But this chaos, well, here's another example of the same lectionary, where Christ is no longer referred to as the Son of Man. He, he's merely the, the human one, as opposed to E.T., you know, uh, the alien one. He, he's the human one. Uh, but now that this chaos is reigning in the Protestant world, you know who's smiling with a tremendous amount of glee? The Roman Catholic Church. Because they see, right before their very eyes, Protestantism going to, going to seed. And so if you turn to, an, uh, uh, not the current, but the um, previous edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, under the heading, the Bible, when they get to the Protestant Bible, they have taken the pains to show you how chaotic and um, full of anarchy the ranks of Protestantism has, has become with regard to the English Bible. Because you'll see here, it says, private versions... It says, it, has, it, has, it is less well known that a number of versions of the Bible or the New Testament, um, notably, or notable parts of them, were made independently of the official public versions, as the RSV, RS, RV, RSV, NEB. And the following account includes all such versions made in the British Isles to the number of 81. So th this isn't even the very, very modern versions. These are all the independent versions, and you see they prominently put the most dominant Protestant Bible there ever was, the authorized version, as their benchmark. And they, then they say this independent Protestant spirit has resulted in 81 different private versions. And if you look this article up, you'll see that many of them, uh, as it says right here, are Unitarian. And their point is that Protestantism is going to seed. I mean, that's a portion of them. If you'll turn the, you turn the page, and then there's another entire column of, column of them. And that's a powerful rhetorical statement. 
where is Protestantism scripture? Where is this chaos leading? Where is it taking us? And uh, certainly it's a powerful point, but it seems to have no real effect on, on evangelicalism because they just keep producing more eccentric editions of scripture. And so Murdoch, uh, Rupert Murdoch knows a good thing when he sees it. He discovered a small regional publishing house, a little ethnic religious publishing house in Grand Rapids, Michigan called Zondervan. And he saw that there were all kinds of um, prophets forecast because they had their sights set on producing a contemporary English Bible that would gain monopolistic status in the uh, community that had the most dispensable income, namely middle-class evangelical Christians. And so he bought out this small little regional publishing house called Zondervan and uh, <clears throat> proceeded to make it the dominant Bible uh, of all times and uh, realized uh, tremendous and considerable profits uh, in the meantime. He's also the publisher of Sun Newspaper, which any of you have been to Great Britain, uh, I know you've not looked at that because you know on page three there's a, um, a disrobed 20-something uh, female from the waist up, and that's why most of the working class buy the Sun Newspaper every morning before they go off to work, bricklaying or whatever they do. Uh, Rupert owns that newspaper as well as Zondervan's NIV, and he also, one of his publishing houses, also publishes uh, uh, the, the, the Satanic Bible. Uh, so this is the crazy, topsy-turvy publishing world of the corporate modern English uh, Bible enterprise. Uh, and, and Rupert Murdoch realized that if the inclusive language lectionaries out there and if the New English Bible has produced an inclusive language edition, uh, the NIV should have one. But he knew that the evangelicals would have a little problem with, uh, br you know, denuding the Bible of its gender quality, masculine quality. And so when they released their first edition of their inclusive language NIV, they didn't release it here, they released it in Great Britain. And World Magazine, of course, exploded this as one great massive conspiracy. And uh, uh, Zondervan backed down and they said, okay, we won't do this since you guys are all upset. And then they went ahead and did it anyway. And so the, today's New International Version came out and a group of scholars who were incensed, who had patronized Zondervan for 30 years, suddenly decided, well, we'll get them back we'll produce our own rival Bible, and we'll drive Zondervan right into the ground. And uh, so how did they do it? All of these dis very upset and, and, and disaffected evangelicals who had been pushing the NIV for 30 years and felt betrayed that it had gone gender inclusive, well, they, they went to the National Council of Churches. They went to the, and said, please, please, National Council of Churches who uh, advocates abortion and advocates the ordination of women and advocates uh, the normalcy of same-sex activity and advocates the ordination of same-sex practitioners. Please, may we use your Bible? Because we want to get back at Zondervan. And we know if we use the big guns, the RSV, that will be the product that, that, can, get, that can get it done. So when you turn to your ESV behind the title page, you'll see it clearly written there that the ESV is adopted from the RSV, which is copyright held by the National Council of Churches. And in fact, the publishers of the ESV will tell you that this Bible is 91% exactly RSV. And when this project was bubbling up in my own ranks, in my own denominational ranks, I called the National Council of Churches and had a very extensive conversation with Spencer Bates, who happens to be the financial administrator of the... Uh, RSV side of things within the National Council of Churches. And I said, um, Spencer, what's the contractual arrangement of Crossways with, with, with National Council of Churches? Because you must see this as kind of bizarre, these evangelicals wanting to pay National Council of Churches a licensing fee to use what was considered the most liberal Bible in, in the world. And he said, well, the contract, I can't give you all the details, but the standard contract normally is they will pay us quarterly a licensing fee based on overall sales. And then, uh, so I made this public, that this is what was going on. And someone got back to me very quickly, 
Uh, it was even said that uh, by one of, the, uh, one of the revisers of the SV, Vern Poitras, sent me a personal email and said he was going to go to my minister and bring me up on charges for m making wild and outlandish claims about the relationship between the ESV and National Council of Churches. Uh, but he didn't know I wasn't Presbyterian, so he'd have a hard time doing that, I think. Um, uh, but, but suddenly, the uh, ESV put on their website, there is no financial arrangement between Crossway and the National Council of Churches. Well, it, that actually ended up being kind of true, because I called Spencer Base back and said, what's going on? They're telling me they're not paying a quarterly fee. He said, well, there was a clause in the contract that said that the, they could pay a lump sum, and they wouldn't have to pay quarterly. So it turns out that some Christian evangelical foundation paid a huge sum of money I suspect six figures are much larger to the National Council of Churches to wipe away and make go away any any umbilical cord connection with the National Council of Churches and that was sort of a stop gap movement once it became publicly known that the relationship was there now if, if, if this Christian Foundation thinks that what they've done was an honorable thing in financing the activities in the National Council of Churches. I want to know why they don't come public and tell us who they were. It's a big secret. I can't seem to get to the bottom of it. And, and uh, uh, no one at Crossway wants to be very helpful about it either, I'm afraid. But, uh, and then they, then they had the audacity to go to Wheaton College, Crossway did, the publishers of ESV, and asked Leland Riken to write an apology for their Bible. You know, and he writes a very thick tome, uh, you know, a book on demand, as it were, on the part of the publisher. I don't think he wrote a manuscript and submitted it. I think they went to him and asked him if he wouldn't please write some nice words about formal equivalence as opposed to what NIV does. And uh, my only question to Mr. Riken is, where was he 30 years ago? Uh, I, you know, the NIV had, had, it, had it all its own way for 30 years. Where was Leland? Why didn't he write something about the criteria of the excellence of Bible translation back then? Suddenly, all of a sudden, it's in vogue to translate correctly because they've gone back to the RSV, which happened to be a formalistic translation, even though it left out a whole lot of material that the early church recognized as Scripture. So uh, I find this extraordinarily disingenuous. I find it opportunistic. And I would encourage you not to buy this book. I told somebody on the phone this afternoon who was praising it. Oh, he says so many good things about formal equivalence. Yeah, well, where was he 30 years ago is what I'd like to know. There's a book out on our table written by uh, the most astute, learned scholar in my lifetime that offered the most devastating critique of dynamic equivalence in the NIV that ever appeared in print. And we have just reprinted it for this conference. That is Professor Jake Jacob van Bruggen from Kamp in the Netherlands. And that is the book you should read. That is a man of integrity. He wrote it by putting his reputation on the line when the NIV was steamrolling the entire evangelical church into submission. He said this is wrong because it's a defection from the doctrine of verbal inspiration. That's the book you should read. I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. Here's some of what they're doing in the ESV. And it's more insidious, at least RSV was up front and took the last 12 verses out and said, this is bad stuff, it's wrong. These people don't have the courage of their own convictions. But they're going to get the job done anyway. They're going to instill doubt in your mind because rather than take the 12 verses out, they put them in double brackets and interrupt the narrative to tell you that what you're going to read now is kind of superfluous because it didn't really happen. Why do we know that? Because it's not in the earliest manuscripts. It's not in the earliest it must have been an afterthought. It must have been added, just like Newton said took place, just like Priestley said took place, and just like all Unitarians say took place, a corruption of original primitive Christianity. That's the evangelical ESV. The woman taken in adultery, the same thing. A precious passage that can be traced all the way back to the earliest records of lectionary activity of the early church and uh, was never doubted, except by some people Augustine said, that we're afraid that if their wives read this account, they might be tempted to go out and commit adultery. So there were some people taking it out of their Bibles, which probably accounts for why it's missing in some manuscripts. It doesn't mean it wasn't in, inauthentic, but according to them, you don't want to believe it because it's not in the earliest manuscripts. Here, again, ESV, uh, you read this last line above the uh, straight line there. 
it turns out they're not all together convinced that John wrote the Gospel of John. But they're going to get that inclusive language in IV. Okay, next one. And here's a Gnostic reading they took right out of Valentinus's Bible. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. Actually, it's in his bosom. They missed that there. It's not at his side. Greek doesn't say at his side. It says in his bosom. He has made him known. Well, that is a Gnostic reading from Valentinos. The correct reading, you read it in your King James Bible when you get home, is the only begotten Son, which is what John says over and over and over and over. It's so perfectly Johannine, there isn't anything else that is more distinctive of his, of his style than that. And here suddenly we got a weird reading. And it's not the only God. It's the only begotten God, by the way. Uh, but somehow they think they understand uh, uh, monogenes better than the Greeks do. If you'll, if you'll go to any Greek Orthodox church and read St. John Chrysostom's liturgy, you'll see when they recite the, the Nicene Creed, they always translate monogenes as only begotten. And Greek is their primary language. They ought to know what the word means. But these crazy evangelicals think they got a better definition. It doesn't mean the only begotten. It means the only one. Or in the footnote, they give you another option. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a little foggy. Or the only one who is God. It, it certainly doesn't mean that. It certainly doesn't mean that at, at, at all. Or, and then they say, in some manuscripts, it's not some, it's the vast majority have son. Because that's what John actually said. And finally, the ESV also leaves out the confession of the, uh, the eunuch. You see the numbering goes from 35, 36, jumps down to 38, and uh, left out his affirmation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just left it right out. Uh, in fact, we had a study in our bulletin. Uh, here you see some manuscripts add all or most of verse 37. We, we have a study in one of our bulletins by a, a very astute text critic, happens to be a female, um, Heimerdinger, uh, who wrote a, 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 in French a, a, a superb study showing that this was in Luke's original account of the book of Acts. And we had it translated into English and published it in our bulletin. We'd be very happy to uh, let you uh, have access to that and the ESV translators for their next update of the ESV. Maybe they'll put it back in. I doubt it. And of course here they, they change um, uh, Joseph, for, and put in the word pater, father. And, and so uh, uh, they have Joseph being Jesus' father instead of distinguishing him from his mother by referring to him by his Christian name or his Jewish name. <laughs> uh, so it's his father and his mother rather than Joseph and his mother. And this has all kinds of implications because now uh, not only did Joseph Priestley argue that the virgin birth nev never took place, but in this book by Jane Skaberg, she argues that Jesus was not virgin born either, that he was the illegitimate son of Joseph, uh, as, as the ESV seems to affirm in that passage we just looked at. And, but that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing, because that means Jesus can identify with other marginalized people. There's another book that just came out that said not only, not only was he illegitimate, look how sad he looks there, oh, that's because he's fatherless. Not only did, did Joseph uh, 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 father Jesus, but then he abandoned him. That's what, so, so Jesus is a sad, he's, not the, he's no longer the son of God, he's the child of God. And he's sad because Joseph abandoned him and Mary, mating, making him a, a single parent child without a fatherless, fatherless, uh, with, with the... Uh, no father to show him the way. So God became his father. It's gripping stuff, isn't it? Just happens to be a load of baloney. And, and finally, we have the Jesus Seminar on the heels of all this. They, the Jesus Seminar came along and said, look, we've had enough of these televangelists preaching for money and corrupting people. Uh, we're going to let them know that there's another side to this story. And we're going to take all this textual evidence that people have in their ivory towers and we're going to popularize it and we're going to start a seminar and we're going to get the press to come in and we're going to tell people we're going to be honest about Jesus and we're going to tell people that the text has been corrupted by the Orthodox and uh, uh, and so you know a whole series of books have come out of the Jesus seminar and they're going to tell you who Jesus really was uh, after they cut through all of the extraneous material that the Orthodox Church 
brought into bear. And this is their final definitive work. This is called the five gospels. And, oh, wait a minute, five? Where'd that other one come from? Well, it's the five gospels because they think the, the early church didn't really recognize the value of that Gnostic gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. And so um, uh, they have included with the four gospels the Gospel of Thomas. And what they're going to give you is uh, what Jesus really said, as opposed to the Bible that the church transmitted and, and that the martyrs died for. And, and th they say here in their introduction that the first steps towards finding the the historical Jesus, getting behind that church Bible, the ecclesiastical text, the first step is, and I quote, the search for the real Jesus begins with a modern critical edition of the Greek New Testament. And you build from there. So uh, there is an affirmation from the Jesus Seminar that what I'm at all about happens to be on target. You start with the critical text, and then you move on from there. So here, the second volume is going to tell us what Jesus really did, as opposed to what the church said he did. And here is the commentary on how they made their choices, how they voted on this thing. And the way they voted is very similar to the way Bruce Metzger and his committee voted on the UBS uh, fourth edition of the Greek New Testament. Uh, but, but evangelicals are not to be left behind, because even though... Um, all the, uh, the, the, the critical side of the academy wants to bring to the attention of the church all the negative evidence uh, disavowing the supernatural elements in the New Testament uh, by going back, to, you know, digging up uh, archaeological manuscript evidence that seems to reflect the church did corrupt the text according to the um, historical critical approach. Evangelicals are trying to keep pace with them. They too, in, in good Warfieldian um, measure, have accepted that the ecclesiastical text is corrupted by the church, but they're going to go searching for the historical text and the historical Jesus as well. And this is a silly book claiming that they found a second century piece of papyrus that tells us something about Jesus. And it's much ado about nothing, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, finally, I, I'm going to end here by saying this is what you need to worry about. As long as the crit higher critical, historical critical practices and conclusions are confined to liberal seminaries and evangelical seminaries, uh, it's impossible for them to have any effect on the rank and file of the church. But with the help of the corporate world, with the help of the Rup Rupert Murdochs of the, of the world, who take this chaos, this fragmentation, this uh, flux, that the academy is experiencing about the historical Jesus based on the quest for the historical text, they, there's always a, month, a dollar to be made here. And as long as the text is in flux and in doubt, you can keep producing update after update after update and continue to have the coffers filled up to the brim. A bit like Tetzel when he tried to get the Sistine Chapel built. Uh, when one indulgence giving forgiveness for something you did in the past wasn't good enough. He upped the ante by selling indulgences that would get forgiveness before you committed the sin. And so the indulgence trade was a booming trade uh, until Martin Luther stepped in and did, did something about it. Now, I'm not so egomaniacal as to think I am a Martin Luther of the 21st century. But I'll tell you what, I'm as fed up with this nonsense as he was with the hawking of, of indulgences, the selling of the grace of God on the street corner, it's the corporate world that you've got to watch out for. And I would encourage every one of you to read this book because it will tell you how the tentacles and the networks of the corporate world are not only controlling states and governments, but religious institutions and publishing houses as well. And I don't want to leave on a, on a paranoid uh, kind of uh, uh, overreactionary note. But so far as I can understand the way things are emerging, this is where your concern needs to be. As long as there's confusion and chaos in the religious academic world, there's going to be somebody who can make a buck about it. And that's what we're all being victimized by. And I'm hoping that some of this information was of some help to you. And um, let me conclude by saying that uh, uh, our purpose in being, as is Ru Russia's, Russ's organization, is to provide sound
and reliable information on the subject so that you can equip yourself and inform yourself so that you can keep from being exploited in the religious publishing world and you can stand up and uh, and know that in fact when Christ said that heaven and earth would pass away but his word would not that you can have absolute uh, unremitting confidence in the truth of that statement knowing who it is that said it thank you very much for your attention God bless you and if we can be of any help to you please get in touch with us thank you what do I think about the new King James and what version would I recommend for a church uh, I answer your second one I would recommend the, the Renaissance Bible because um, anybody who's read anything about the work that Tyndale did and a book that if the, if the established Bible of the Anglican Church, what we call the authorized version, is of any importance to you, I would ask you to read Gerald Hammond's History of the English Bible. It is the most meticulous, uh, the most insightful analysis of the importance of Tyndale's work that has ever been written. If anybody could pick up an NIV or an ESV after reading that book, uh, they're not reading plain English because it is the most successful uh, attempt to show how Tyndale, the authorized version is nine-tenths his Bible, by the way. They, they, they were so impressed with what he did that very seldom even touched what he ended up doing. He demonstrates in that book how Tyndale took the Greek and Hebrew languages and molded the English language around them, even replicating idiomatic expressions, so that the English language was absolutely infused with Hebrew idiom and, and, and references and images from the inspired Hebrew and Greek Bible. And, and, and today's approach is to take the English language and mold the Hebrew and Greek around uh, our, our sloppy language which causes us to think sloppily and and so remodify the faith according to our values and our interests whether it be feminism egalitarianism uh, uh, or any number of ideologies and and for that reason I don't think there's any Bible in English that you can recommend beyond the Bible that came out of the English Reformation and Renaissance that's the authorized version as for the New King James it's a gimmick yes they use the TR in the New Testament but that's like the lore on the end of the line and uh, it's another corporate entity whose Old Testament text is not based on the same form of the Hebrew Bible that the authorized version was based on there are all kinds of faux pas in the translation if you look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 1 17 you'll see that rather than us being saved in the New King John we are being saved I'm not being saved. Maybe the translators of the New King James are. I'm not being saved. Uh, there are other, uh, other problems. They never should have jettisoned second person singular plural distinction because the Greek and the Hebrew demand it. Only Elizabethan English can provide that. It's another corporate gimmick. Uh, having said that, I will concede that it's the lesser of all evils. If somebody is so completely psychologically psyched out that they will not pick up a King James Bible, and unless they read something that seems to be contemporary colloquial speech, shove a new King James their way until you can get them on the good Bible. But that's, as, that's the most I'm going to say about that. Only that nobody's reading it anymore. You know, it's a, it's a great barometer of where we're at spiritually and how victimized we've been by consumerism. Because I'll guarantee you, anyone who's gone into a bookstore to buy an NIV or an ESV has done it because of the input of some kind of consumerist blitzing advertising. But occasionally they do it because they know somebody who knew somebody who worked on the committee. Uh, but uh, we're being, we need to be good consumer advocates on this. We need to be good Protestants, the priesthood of all believers, and have a good thinking understanding of our faith and not be passive on this issue. I think most Christians think that Zondervan and Thomas Nelson are religious organizations because they publish the Bible. They aren't. They're cold, hard, profit-making entities. And mark my words, <clears throat> Crossways thought that the, 
that, that, that they'd be immune to this because they are a nonprofit publisher. But you watch and see if they have success with the ESV, see if they don't eventually change their status because so much revenue is coming in that the IRS will be breathing down their backs and they'll have to change their status. I could be wrong. I'm not claiming to be a prophet, but look and see if something like that doesn't happen. Wouldn't no, of course, there are archaisms. There are archaisms that can be updated in the authorized version, and I have no problem with that, and none of us should in principle. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> Cambridge University is updating the authorized version right now as we speak, very modestly, and uh, it remains to be seen what the end product will be, but if, if it is as, as conservative and modest as, as I'm thinking it may be, it could, it could be um, something beneficial to the church, but we've got to wait and see. Yes, sir? What is your view of the majority text, and if you believe the TR is better, why? Yeah. The majority text is a published edition of that form of the Greek New Testament that the TR also was derived from, minus some Latin readings that Erasmus uh, uh, spliced into his TR edition, because he believed that there was good and weighty reasons for why uh, they, they, they should be included, believing that probably they were in the original Greek tradition and somehow in transmission were left out. None of them, by the way, are critical, uh, except for the three heavenly witnesses. And it really is one of the most controversial passages. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a, those people who advocate the majority text tend to be pretty good scholars. Maurice Robinson, I count a friend. But they also, almost to the man, happen to be um, Baptists. Uh, there, are, there is some exception to it. Jacob Van Bruggen is an advocate of the majority text, so far as I understand. He is Dutch Reformed. He is not Baptist. But most of them are Baptists, which means they have no theological connection or historical connection to the old Anglican Bible. Because Baptists, I'm going to alienate a lot of people here, but Baptists believe that they are restorationists. They are going back to the first century. And um, uh, as, as, a, as a result, they have no emotional or religious ties or no traditional ties to the authorized version in the historical sense. I know fundamentalists do, but they don't view the King James Bible as the official Bible of the Anglican Church. Somehow it's a disconnected, um, contextless book. Uh, but it is, in fact, the established English Bible of the Church of England. Um, so majority text advocates don't have any sort of also no literary interest in the, the uh, unparalleled quality of the English Bible of, of, of the Renaissance. So what they want to do is somehow repristinate the majority text, but they don't have an easy job of it. I have a, the introduction to my book on the table out there called The Majority Text is my personal critique of the majority, majority text school. They have, as, I'll just conclude by saying, they have as many problems determining what is the majority reading as we might have with the various conflicting readings in the TR. So uh, all things being equal, I'll stay with the TR uh, because all of Protestantism is grounded on it in terms of exegesis, homiletics. That is to say, every commentary that came out of the Protestant Reformation was written around the TR. Every sermon that was preached from the 16th century basically to the 19th was preached from the TR. Every creed, confession, and bit of catechism that was written from the 16th century through the 17th century had proof text, not from the majority text, but from the TR. So those reasons are compelling enough to stay with that as a standard. Finally, there isn't that much difference between the TR and the majority text. I mean, if you're doing it to placate the critical school, I give it up because in my introduction, they weren't impressed with the Zane Hodges and Farstadt Greek majority text, I can assure you. I think we will conclude uh, with that question. And thank you once again, Dr. Lee.